Good afternoon, everybody. Um, to our colleagues here with us in Schultz and also in F1210, and to uh, those at the Roslyn campus, welcome to the third in our series of TBLT lectures, funded by the Cox Foundation with support from the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. We are grateful to them for making this series possible. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Ullman. Uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Ullman is from Georgetown University, where he is professor of neuroscience. Today he will talk about how understanding the neurocognition of language can help us improve second language learning and teaching. I should add that this is not the first time um, uh, that Dr. Ullman is addressing an audience at FSI. He was plenary speaker at the Interagency Language Roundtable <coughs> meeting in 2006, uh, and I think on several other occasions, if I'm not mistaken. Many of us still recall his powerful message about the workings of the brain and implications for language learning. So we're particularly delighted for this opportunity for an update. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Ullman. So um, I'm going to talk about this, how understanding the neurocognition, so the neural and cognitive basis of language, can help us improve second language, so additional foreign language, mainly adult learned language, learning and teaching and pedagogy, okay? And the main message, the one-liner or three-liner, is that, as you'll see, increasing evidence suggests that second language learning representation and use, as well as in different ways, somewhat different ways, first language, depend importantly on two well-studied learning and memory systems in the brain, usually called declarative and procedural memory, and that our understanding of these systems from animal studies, where we do a lot more invasive work, or we do a lot more, as well as from human studies, about these two memory systems, with neurobiological bases, how learning occurs in them, and of more interest in this talk, yeah. how learning can and retention and use can be improved in them. Okay, we know a lot about these things, and therefore this should also apply to language and of interest to your second language. So this independent knowledge and of interest to you guys primarily, I think, how <coughs> learning can be improved in these systems can be leveraged, taken advantage of to help second language learning, improve second language learning in pedagogy. That's sort of the take home message, okay? <coughs> so this is highly collaborative work. These are a number of my collaborators. The, the work I'll talk about today is, doesn't involve all of them, but uh, the, the research program does. And of course, thank, thank them and my funders. Okay, so first, let's talk briefly about generally how generally cognitive neuroscience, so that study of cognition, language and memory and attention and so on, in the brain, so co defined cognitive neuroscience, um, and uh, its relation to language learning and pedagogy and teaching. So first of all, it's been difficult thus far for the cognitive neuroscience field of second language to guide, to help language learning and pedagogy. First, for two reasons. First, the cognitive neuroscience of second language, L2, as I'll refer to it, is a new field, relatively new field, still an emerging field, okay? And there have been, until recently at least, relatively few clear findings to work off of. You don't know what you're doing in cognitive neuroscience, how can you apply that to second language? And the second point is, even for those findings that have been relatively robust in cognitive neuroscience with respect to second language. It's been difficult to apply these for the improvement of language, second language learning and pedagogy. So even what we know, it's been difficult to say, okay, well this is how these, these can be used to improve second language learning and pedagogy. However, and this is basically what my talk will be about, <coughs> there have been important advances in the cognitive neuroscience of L2 not that we understand everything, but we understand certain things more and more, including what I'll talk about today. And so therefore, that's what we see here. So understanding of the cognitive neuroscience of second language has improved with advances in both theory and empirical findings. 
know more what the patterns are, but some reliability. And these, at least some of these theory and findings, some of this theory and findings, suggest clear <coughs> paths, have clear suggestions for how one may improve language learning and pedagogy. Okay? Um, <coughs> and so what I'll talk about today is one particular theoretical framework that I've been working on now for more than 20 years, which really seems to be not entirely wrong. For science, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, and really does seem to suggest some ways in which second language can be improved. Okay? <coughs> so, what's the motivation and approach of this theoretical perspective? So, a general principle of evolution in biology is that existing mechanisms or systems are reused for new functions. Okay? So for example, scales evolved into feathers. Feathers didn't come from nowhere, it came from something else. They're now used for new things. Feathers originally actually were for, are thought to have been used all for thermal regulation, at least in part. And then eventually they were used for flight. So they clip on reusing systems or mechanisms or structures for new functions. Or fins evolved into limbs and then wings and hands, kind of circularly in a way, an interesting way. A wing, of course, can be used to swim for certain pieces of bird or to help guide them in the water. Um, or an example I like to give, <coughs> the certain species of heron, like the, I think it's the tricolor heron, among others, where they use their wings, okay, which were evolved for, evolved for flight, not for this purpose, but they have these wings, the, the, the wings have been co-opted, hijacked, reused for a new purpose, which is they shade the water and spot to better see the frogs and the fish they're going after. So an existing structure used for an entirely new function. So this is how biology and evolution tend to work. Therefore, given this principle of co-optation, as it's often called, of reuse, we should expect that language should depend at least in part, if not largely, on pre-existing mechanisms or systems, even though language appears to be, in certain ways, at least unique to humans. <coughs> Whether or not those brain systems have become themselves more specialized for language in certain ways, either evolutionarily, so further specialized, so we, you know, we use in that way, or um, um, developmentally, ontogenetically, right? So as we grow up, they can specialize because of the way neuronal circuitry works. And we simply focus, there are lots of systems or mechanisms in the brain we could look at this way. Some people do, for example, with respect to working memory or attention. We focus on what are arguably the two most important learning and memory systems in the brain. Declarative memory, I'm going to use my right hand, you will always be on the right, in green, so if you're color oriented, it's green, if you're spatial, it's here, and procedural memory, okay, in this kind of pinkish red color. So these are arguably the two most important learning and memory systems of the brain, and since most, if not all, of language must be learned, even if there are aspects of it that are innately specified, these two systems should play a really important role in learning language, given the principles I just laid out, that what you have already is what you read. So if this is what we use for learning, we should be using these for language as well, even if they might have become further specialized, either evolutionarily or developmentally. <coughs> and our approach, our empirical approach, is simply to test if and how various aspects of language depend on these two systems. Okay? One of the main advantages of this approach is what I laid out in the opening slide, this kind of one-liner, three-liner, as I said. So from animal and human studies, because these systems exist in other vertebrates as well, as we'll see, I'll briefly mention that, we know a lot about these systems. We understand their computational basis, how they learn, their anatomy, their molecular basis, their pharmacology, so how learning can be improved the genetic basis, and other ways in which learning and retention of interest to you guys can be improved, such as behavioral techniques and so on. Okay? So therefore, we can make very specific, based on this independent <coughs> knowledge from animal human study, specific novel, often novel, and testable predictions that might be unwarranted, that we have no reason to make in the more circumscribed, more limited study of language. So you're just studying language, what genes do you look for, for example, right? Well, we know what genes are, we know a fair bit about what genes are involved in these two memory systems, so, oh, they should be involved in language, or we would predict that they should be involved in language in similar ways as to their roles in 
at least in every system, is inedible to humans. And then, of course, they may or may not be tested, but it's a very powerful prediction. Okay. Similar way with <coughs> learning and memory enhancement techniques. We know a fair bit about how we can improve learning and memory in these systems. Well, that should be true for second language as well. That's so a very, very powerful approach. Doesn't mean it's right. As I said a few minutes ago, you know, most science is wrong. Most theories are at least partly wrong. You know, this supposedly replicability crisis is overblown, but basically science is well, not always, empirical findings aren't always replicated. But nevertheless, as we'll see, I think there's something right about this. <coughs> okay, so a little more, more detailed bottom line, and I'm gonna show the same slide at the end of the first two thirds of the talk before going into the more pedagogic learning stuff uh, to remind you of the findings. This is basically what I'll be showing you. <coughs> So converging evidence, everybody know what converging evidence means? So basically it means you get it from different sources. So if you tell me, oh, so-and-so stumbled in the hall, it's like, okay, and then another person saw it, and I hear it, and I see it, and so on and so forth. Converging evidence is why you get convinced about things, right? One source has its weaknesses, you know, the person may be unreliable, they may not have good vision, the scientific fact of this, you know, the method might have certain weakness, and so on. You always want converging evidence before you believe an right, uh, idea. So converging evidence from different studies, methods, etc., as we'll see, suggests that language in fact depends on both of these learning and memory systems, and interestingly, that lexical and grammatical knowledge depend <coughs> differentially on the two systems. Specifically, the learning and use of idiosyncratic, that is unpredictable, okay, arbitrary, i.e. lexical knowledge, the fact that cat means cat, you know, shine, French, gato, and so on. Okay, it's just arbitrary stuff about languages. <coughs> For meaning connection depends heavily on declarative memory. And you'll see, once we learn about declarative memory, that this makes sense. Okay, because declarative memory seems to be necessary, just giving you a preview, for learning arbitrary stuff. This falls really beautifully. And little of it all on procedural memory. A little bit, but not much. <coughs> In contrast, rule-governed grammatical knowledge, that is, Rule governed combination of syllables, phonemes, morphemes, words into phrases, sentences, okay, depends heavily on procedural memory, but also, this is the full part, one of the interesting parts, also to a fair extent on declarative memory as a function of lots of different factors. So, for example, females depend more on declarative memory on average, it's always on average, than males, probably because they have better declarative memory. So they depend more on it, they're better at it. Second language, we'll of course spend much more time on this, depends more on declarative memory for gra grammar uh, than uh, in first language. Okay? And you can probably already start thinking why that might be. Is it explicit instruction? Is it that we'll talk about when you're actually good at two memory systems during development? Actually, adults turn out to be better at declarative memory than young kids, things like that. Uh, a lot of my work is on disorders. I'm just going to touch it. And, you know, Talk about some passing, DLD, uh, developmental language disorder, it's like dyslexia, cochlear co dyslexia, in fact, used to be called specific language impairment. They have problems with procedural memory, it looks like. So if your problem's this, you rely on the good thing, declarative memory. And then other things as well. This is actually of interest, I'll talk about that very briefly again. If you, ha if you hear uh, higher frequency complex forms, like the cat, if you hear the cat a thousand times, you're gonna stop putting it together and you start memorizing like a big word. Okay? So frequency matters too. There are lots of different factors at these different levels that modulate whether or not the function of grammar depends more on declarative memory or procedural memory. Okay? And so the two memory systems play partially or largely redundant roles. They can both do the same thing. They can both do grammar but in different ways as we'll see and in different circumstances. So it's not that grammar is done here and lexicon done here. It's rather that they both depend on both systems, particularly grammar. Okay, so what are these beasts? So in the next few slides, I'll first get background on declarative memory in this slide. Then on procedural memory in the next slide. Then on some key ways that are relevant to second language learning and pedagogy on how those two systems interact. <coughs> 
and then we'll look at our predictions, and then we'll look at the evidence, first for first language as a baseline, then second language, and then we'll transition into what you're really interested in, I think, of course the basic stuff's also me fun, I hope for some of you too, which is actually how all this can be used to improve language learning, second language learning, and pedagogy. So of course we'll get the foundation here of memory systems, then foundation, the next level of first and second language, and then how that can be used to improve second language. So that's several steps. <coughs> so, declarative um, memory is found in other vertebrates. For example, it helps birds remember where they put their acorns. Old, old system, okay. <coughs> it's often characterized, at least in humans, as underlying knowledge for what? So remembering an event, so-called episodic knowledge or episodic memory, that I just had a good dish of oxtails at the Vietnamese restaurant with your colleagues here, it's really fun. Um, or knowing a fact, for example, just taking a random capital, what's the capital of Burkina Faso? We're going to do, no one ever does that, you guys are really good. <laughs> okay. So um, that's just a fact, an arbitrary fact, that's the kind of thing that would be stored in semantic memory within declared memory. System appears to be per specialized, I can think of what's computational basis in a sense, for learning arbitrary bits of information and associating them. Okay. And in fact, as we'll see a little bit more in the next uh, couple of slides, this seems to be necessary. This system can be necessary for learning arbitrary stuff. If you want to learn arbitrary stuff, it pretty much has to be learned within declarative memory. Okay. <coughs> um, so by arbitrary bits of information associating them, I mean, you know, Wagadugu, Burkina Faso Capital, or Michael Lunch Today, Vietnamese restaurant, oxtail soup, and so on. Okay? All these different things that are linked together. The learning is rapid in this system. It's uh, sometimes referred to as one-shot learning. So you now know what I had for lunch, even though I have repeated it once. Okay? You can learn very rapidly in this system, although of course, as with all learning, repetition helps. And that's not the case, by the way, the one-shot learning procedure, not the slightest bit, in fact. Um, so some of you may have heard of declarative memory. You may think of it, oh, that's the memory system that underlies explicit knowledge, that is knowledge that can be brought to conscious awareness. Wrong. It does underlie explicit knowledge, knowledge that can be brought to conscious awareness. And in fact, it seems to be the only long-term system, memory system that does underlie it, but it also underlies implicit knowledge that we're not aware of. So declarative memory, is defined or is best defined in terms of its neural bases, which I'll get to next, and not in terms of explicit or implicit knowledge. Okay? And anyway, maybe a lot of the audience to go into detail with, but um, it's kind of silly to say that this was the brain, this brain system only underlay explicit knowledge to begin with. How would you show that it doesn't, does not underlie implicit knowledge? It's almost impossible. It's not impossible to show that. And okay, we now know that it does. Okay, how about the, what's called the functional neuroanatomy? So what parts of the brain do what? Um, so I'll go a bit more slowly here because most of you don't have a brain background with some exceptions. Um, so the hippocampus and other medial temporal obstructures can be thought of as the foundation of the system. And they underlie the learning of new information, like associating these different things like Michael, lunch, Vietnamese, food, oxtail soup, and so on. And their consolidation is their stabilization over time, for example, during sleep. Okay, but not only really during sleep. Okay, and I'll point to the hippocampus in a second. Um, whereas in the longer term, this knowledge that you learn, okay, with practice and with time, both probably, depends on neocortex, okay, around the cerebrum, the outside of the cerebrum mainly but not only in the temporal lobes. Okay? So different structures are involved in the learning and in the eventual storage. This is a simple way of thinking about it. And other re regions in, uh, form part of this network, including, for example, frontal structures here, okay, uh, which are involved in pulling out that information. Oh, what's that called? Oh, it's um, <coughs> oh, rice cake was the name of the restaurant that we just went to, that kind of thing. You're trying to recall it. That involves at least in part frontal regions. So here we see um, what's called a sagittal view, which is cut this way. So basically it's like this, and you're, cut, you're cutting right kind of a little bit in, so not laterally, but medially. You cut it here, an MRI, and you see hippocampus in blue. It's not really in blue, it's just colored here. 
Um, and some nearby structures, then if you cut this way, you see these structures here, hippocampus, and the other structures that form part of the medial temporal lobe. And these are heavily connected with neocortex, and so through their connections, that learning involves in the eventual storage in the long term. Okay? We also know something about the lower level biological substrates of this system, about the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that allow neurons to communicate with each other. The hormone estrogen, picture of estrogen here, plays a positive role in this system. So this sort of higher levels of estrogen, you learn and or retain better in this system, okay? Um, and that may explain why, on average, females tend to be better at declarative memory than males. Okay? It may not be the only reason. And we know something about the genes, for example, um, genes for various proteins, BDNF, hypogony, and so on. So the main point about this, is we know a fair bit about the system, so we can make predictions. And one of the things we know about the system that I'll talk about later, and I've mentioned several times broadly, is how learning and retention and use can be improved in the system. Such as, to throw some words out that you have probably heard, maybe work with, like the spacing effect, testing effect, these both work specifically, or particularly, not specifically, within this system. Um, a variety of other findings of how learning and memory can be improved, for example, exercise and sleep and so on mainly pertain to this system, less so to procedural memory. Uh, in general, in fact, procedural memory is less well understood, it's a more nebulous beast, okay? Whereas this is really, we understand this system pretty well. So let's turn to the other one. <coughs> procedural memory is also found in other vertebrates. For example, it helps rats follow what's called a the rule govern grooming sequence, like the order in which they clean themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's often characterized um, as knowledge for how. Do you remember what we said for declarative memory was knowledge for? What? 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 So this is more, so what is the capital for King Possum? What did Michael have for lunch? This is how. How do you do something? Okay? So that is the learning and processing of motor and cognitive skills, such as typing, learning to type, or to ride a bicycle, learning sequences, categories, rules. But one of the best studied paradigms in, uh, in rodents, so we understand it very well, is root learning. So to simplify, basically you have what's called a T maze. You go on the bottom of the T, there's a T here, so this is the, the, the stem. And if the reward is always on one side, so they always turn left, for example, eventually that learning becomes, that, that process becomes automatized and that learning occurs in procedural memory. Okay, as an example of something that's in, in animals, that depends on procedural memory. <coughs> we understand less about this system than declarative memory, but it probably is something <coughs> close to this, maybe specialized for learning to predict, like to predict the next step in sequence, to predict the output of a rule, something like that. Okay, for those of you interested in, we just published a paper, it's already out, this annual view of psychology, it comes out before it actually comes out. Um, the pre-proofs, um, where we really go into depth in this. Um, I think a great depth other people have before if you really want to understand procedural memory and its characteristics. Okay? It's on our website, and it's on annual review of psychology website too. Um, especially to predict when you get rapid feedback. So if you predict that this will happen, and you get quick feedback as to whether that prediction was correct or incorrect, that's when procedural memory tends to learn. Uh, learning is gradual, so when you learn to ride a bicycle, do you learn right away, like in declarative memory, like you know, the one-shot learning I mentioned before? No, it takes you lots of practice. Learning is very gradual in procedural memory. Okay. <coughs> Start thinking about how this applies to language, and all the things I'm saying, because that's the first point of this. Right. Um, but eventually, even though learning is slow, the use of the skills becomes rapid and reliable. Right? When you're really, really automatized at something like typing or riding a bicycle or driving or whatever, you don't have to pay attention, you react quickly, um, it's very reliable, you're not going to make mistakes. Right? Um, it's also hard to change. So declarative memory is much more flexible than procedural memory. Once you, you, will, you become what's called automatized in procedural memory, you're kind of stuck with it. It's hard to change that. It's a habit. In fact, the word habit is often used for this system. What you want in this system. Um, and you also don't forget retention. Okay? You can again start seeing uh, how this may be relevant to language, right? All these different characteristics. <coughs> and knowledge apparently is only implicit in this system, which again 
just ask a lot of language, which is implicit, including, of course, grammar. Okay? You have to hire a linguist to figure out what the rules are that we all know. How about the functional neuroanatomy? That is, what parts of the brain do what? So this system, what was the declarative? This is the testing effect here. So you won't remember this. What was the declarative memory system rooted in? Which structures? Or structure? Hippocampus. Hippocampus would be like the main structure, exactly. One that you should, uh, there's one structure you remember for that. It's the hippocampus. What's the one structure you probably remember here? Basal ganglia. Okay. <coughs> so this system is rooted in the basal ganglion's connections to frontal cortex. So the basal ganglia are structures deep inside the brain. It's actually basal ganglia, yeah, so it's several structures, like the caudate nucleus and the putamen and some other structures. And this cluster of structures, of course, on each side of the brain, everything is ducked on each one set or one structure on each side, is very closely connected to frontal cortex. Within this circuit, these circuits on each side, the basal ganglia, in particular certain portions of it, the anterior, that's the kind of more front portions of these two structures, the caudate and putamen, are important for learning new stuff, like learning to type, learning to ride a bike, learning to turn left in the T-base, and so on, okay? Um, and that knowledge, once it's learned, is eventually uh, dependent, you think, on which other structure? Like testing effect? And <laughs> If you read at least, or is it reading effect? <laughs> um, frontal cortex, right? So it's very much in a way like declarative memory that you learn in the hippocampus and you store in the neocortex. Here you learn in the basal ganglia and you process in the neocortex once you've really automatized these things. So here we see it again basal ganglia, particularly these two structures, the caudate and the putamen, are important for learning and stabilization, consolidation of new stuff. But once that stuff is automatized, it depends more on frontal structures, particularly motor related frontal structures. We know a little bit about the biological substrates, like the neurotransmitter, dopamine plays an important role. So again, we can leverage this because they're drugs that enhance dopamine, okay? Or that mimic dopamine, dopamine agonists. And possible genes. We know again less about this system than declarative memory, but these genes, even the infamous FOXP2 gene, which has been claimed to be in the language sheet, it's actually a gene that probably is better characterized as playing a role in procedural memory and therefore in language. Okay? So again, we know a fair bit about this system. How can this be leveraged about to tell something about language, including possibly um, how to improve language learning? So one of the things I'll talk about later is how to encourage automatization, right? So you're faster, automatic, more reliable, okay? <coughs> Which of these two systems, declarative or procedural memory, declarative or procedural memory, should be engaged if we want to automatize, automatize something in second language? Procedural or declarative? It's a point. Procedural, right? And how about if you want to learn something quickly, thinking of what you guys do as language teachers? Which one should we engage? Declarative. And what if you want to learn words? Which one? Declarative. What if you want to learn grammar? Careful. Both, but maybe initially, naturally, initially, probably here, but if you want to eventually here, but maybe there are ways of pushing it one way or the other, which is what we're going to talk about. Okay. So you can see how once we know about these two learning and memory systems, it can be useful not only for understanding how second language learning occurs, which is what we'll get to, but also how to manipulate <coughs> that to the advantage of the learner and the teacher. Okay, so finally about the two memory systems, how do these two memory systems interact? So there are several ways, but we'll talk about two here. This one, the first one, oops, is particularly important for today. <coughs> what some people call a cooperative interaction, uh, we call redundant, we think of it in terms of redundant mechanisms. So, some things we do, some tasks or functions, um, seem to be learnable only here, that is, they have to be learned here, or only here. So, for example, where does arbitrary stuff have to be learned? Like where I have lunch. Where do you have to learn that at this point? <laughs> Declared, okay? Um, it's possible that there's some things that are have to be learned procedural memory, like maybe some low-level motor-related stuff that ends up being automatized. It's less clear. Okay, but most things we do, and in particular, I think it'll be almost everything that's higher-level cognition, including in language. Not most, but not not all, like not arbitrary stuff, but everything else, probably can be learned by both systems, but crucially in different ways. So, for example, root learning. Remember how the rats learned to navigate the maze in procedural memory? They kind of automatically learned to turn in a different direction. Okay, so it's kind of like 
what we do as debt reckoning. And it's automatized. Like that distance that we just automatically follow a route without thinking. How else do we navigate? Landmarks. Ah, turn left at the Exxon station, stop at the tree, et cetera, et cetera, right? So same with rats. This is, whereas um, in rats, the, the, the procedural one, turning left is called response learning. Landmark based learning is called place learning, okay? And so basically they, the, a picture of, I don't know, Jim on the wall, and of course they're gonna turn towards Jim. Now they're not turning one direction, they're turning towards Jim. So if you rotate the maze, now they turn the other direction, you always go towards Jim. That's called place learning, so it's landmark based learning. And that depends on declarative memory, on hippocampus. So you can navigate, you can solve your problem either way, but using different strategies. Either here or here, but in, in different ways. Okay? One is turning automatically, one is turning towards a landmark. <coughs> and there's a big literature, emerging literature, it's not, not small anymore, on this in humans as well, as well where people, where you have learnt humans learning sequences, like you know, motor sequences, categories, rules, and so on, where they can learn it both ways, but differently. Okay? <coughs> Including sometimes explicitly in declarative memory, but not in procedural memory. So various factors affect which system, now we start getting closer to what we're interested in here, most of you are interested in. Various factors, various variables, uh, modu modulate, affect which of these two systems is relied on more. So, as I just said, I'll ask you now, um, if I teach you something explicitly, which system are you more likely to learn it in? This point. Declarative. <coughs> if you can learn, second question, if you can learn something in either system, which system do you think should learn it first? Declarative. It's faster at learning, right? You just learn it. Um, or what a lot of my work is on, and some of the second, well, the second language work we'll talk about today um, is what I call functionality. So if, um, I don't know, Marsha's good at declarative memory, Jim is good at procedural memory, where should they tend to learn navigate? Where would Marsha learn to, uh, navigation? She's like this, Jim's like this. Where should Marsha learn navigation? Declarative memory. And Jim, more than procedural memory as compared to Jim, is more precise way of putting it. Right? So how good you are at one versus the other should push you to one or the other. I, my right hand's stronger than my left hand. I tend to use my right hand. So that's a very simple analogy. Okay? <coughs> so there are a number of different factors which affect, which can push learning in one to one of the other systems. There are many more as well. <coughs> uh, this is just fun. I don't think it comes up in today's talk, but some of our work is on this. So it turns out there's a fair bit of evidence that bad on one side becomes good on the other side. This is seesaw effect. Okay, we don't fully understand it. I think I understand it better now after that writing that chat that paper I just took mentioned in annual review of psychology. But it's still not really well understood. Um, in fact, estrogen, as an example of that, uh, not only seems to improve declarative memory, but may, it's not so totally clear, suppress, inhibit aspects of procedural memory. So there's this, and this, this is important actually for you, I don't think this I was gonna actually directly bring up on this, but um, it's important when you think about the kind of manipulation of learning in the two memory systems that, might want, want, that you might want to do, that we want to, might want to do to encourage second language learning. So if you want to say, okay, well let's do learn grammar here first because it's quick, and then here because it's automatic and robust, right? Well, but what if learning here suppresses learning here? It can get really tricky, and we don't fully understand this, but it's just something to think about and be careful of, because these are always more complex than you think. So it's not just like, oh, it's here and then here. It could be more here and then less here, and then you have to like go back again. Okay, does that make sense? So the seesaw is relevant to what we're gonna talk about today, but I don't think I have any particular, particular line on that. Okay, so we have this background so this is all really motivated, right? As I said before, we're building up, going from the memory systems to language, language from first language to second language, and then to what we predict about how second language can be improved. So it's really building up in a very solid way, hopefully. <coughs> so um, here are our predictions for first and second language from this independent knowledge of the two memory systems that we just went through. So what would some of our predictions be? What would we predict should be learned in, in declarative memory? 
What's the most obvious thing? It was already in that, that slide with converging evidence. Vocabulary. Vocabulary is arbitrary stuff that, for the most part, right? The form itself and the form meaning connection. And so that would pre be predicted to be learned in declarative memory. And that's what we have here. Lexical memory should be learned in declarative memory. That is the memory store of at least, not only, all arbitrary word-specific stuff. Cat and what it means, morphologically regular stuff like big dud, and in syntax too, of course, there's lots of irregular stuff in syntax. Right? The fact that devoured English requires a complement. You could say I eat or I eat something, but you have to say I devour something. It's just a fact of English, just to memorize that. Anything that's arbitrary should be learned in declarative memory. <coughs> how about procedural memory? Eh, not so clear, but how about something like anything that involves sequences, rules, and learning to predict would be a good candidate. Okay, so make grammar a good candidate. So that is the rule governed hierarchical and sequential composition and decomposition, kind of an input or output, of complex forms, such as in syntax, combining the and cat, or noun phrase and verb phrase, or integrating linguistic features into the hierarchy, or morphology, like walk and ed, or in phonology, combining the different segments, the or ik, or, this, or the syllables, according to the phonotactics, for those of you who have linguistic background the phonotactics, the phonological grammar of the particular language you're talking about. Okay, so, so far, words, grammar. Vocabulary, grammar. Aha, but can't we memorize speeches and lyrics and poems or even words, right? Once you get to Noblik, that's here, right? So, a lot of grammar should be able to depend on declarative memory too. And not just as chunks like that, like memorizing the man walked over there or four score and years ago, uh, and seven years ago or whatever, but also in other ways too, such as learning rules explicitly and other ways that I won't go into today. Involve so associative generalization and other techniques. So this system here can do a lot of grammar. Not as much as this, and which, where would grammar be more automatized? Point to it. Okay, where would grammar be learned first? Okay, where would grammar be more flexible in the sense of being able to change it, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is really powerful, this is really useful. Okay? Now we can finally ask what modulates the relative dependence, what affects the relative dependence of grammar on one or the other system, what makes it depend more on one or the other system. Okay? And there are a whole bunch of factors. And I'll focus, of course, on this one today, second versus first language. Sex is one of them. We have a whole research program on that as well. So which sex, male or female, should depend more on declarative memory for grammar? I mentioned this briefly before. More declarative. So since females are, on average, this is always distributional generalizations, better at declarative and possibly worse in procedural, with males, let's call it an arbitrary baseline here for males, females more on declarative and less on there's quite a bit of evidence that at least some aspects of grammar show that pattern. <coughs> uh, of interest here, um, actually I'll do this one first because I'm usually I talk a fair bit about that obviously with you guys. I just took that out of, <coughs> out of my talk. So there are a bunch of disorders, including developmental disorders such as dyslexia, autism, possibly in a more complex way, or developmental language disorder, which look like this. That seems to be the case. Okay, um, becoming all of these, it's actually becoming clearer for. Okay, and so what would happen? First of all, this might go up because of the seesaw effect, and even if it doesn't, whether it's here or here, where are you going to do grammar? Point to it. Declare it because this is worse than this, right? This is why my left hand is worse than my right hand. So I use my right hand. You know, the left, my right hand were chopped off. That would compensate my left hand, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's a whole area of research on that, which is actually pretty cool. <coughs> okay, let's focus on this. So how is L2, that is later learned language, uh, different from L1, native, first language, native language? Well, one of the obvious ways, of course, is that it's learned later, right? So let's look at um, what might be called the developmental trajectory of the memory system. Okay, so when you're a kid, here's infancy, and as you get older this way, okay, time is on this axis. Okay, the x-axis here. How good are you at declarative memory when you're an infant? What do you think? Do you remember stuff when you were from when you were an infant? Mm 
Okay? Whatever the reasons for that are, you're pretty bad. There's even a term for it called infantile amnesia. Okay? You're pretty bad. <laughs> you get better and better. Better and better. What do you think is your best period for learning stuff in declarative memory? Say again? Yeah. So adolescence, young adulthood, and then, woe to most of us, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> okay. Goes down. Okay. And actually it's nonlinear, probably. It goes like this. And then as you get older and older, it goes to keep on speed. Okay? How about procedural memory? Do you think you're we're pretty good at that? I don't know about infancy, I don't think we know that, but pretty early on in early childhood? Yeah. Okay. And anecdotally, this actually always resonates with people, even though it's just anecdotally. You know, if you want to become a gymnast, an uh, expert gymnast or violinist or whatever, you have to start pretty early. It's not just the number of euros that you do it, it's also when you start. Okay? And there's an empirical literature on this. As always, it's a little bit more confused than the literature on declarative memory. But basically, procedural memory learning abilities and retention abilities, consolidation, starts pretty good. And then it might go down, sorry, yeah, go down around adolescence. And then what do you think happens at, from in, in older ages? Goes down again. <laughs> Stay around 20. <laughs> That's the take home message, right? Okay, so there, therefore, when you are a kid learning your first language, or by the way, a second language is a kid, so now, because this is age based, right? At least what we're focusing on now. What does it look like? Are you good at this or bad at this? Bad, declare it memory. And are you pretty good at this? Yeah, so you're pretty good. So where should you learn your grammar? Mainly. Procedurally. You still might start with here. We, we stand with, we have evidence for that. You should, you know, because this is going to be initially, it's probably good enough to start learning your grammar here. But you can transition pretty damn well to this. Right? <coughs> you take your 20 year old, or your 30 or 40, okay? After a certain age, it becomes less clear that declarative memory declines faster than procedural. So let's, let's stick with the 20 year old or 30 year old. What does a 30 year old look like here? Pretty high. How about here? Probably lower, less clear, but probably lower. So where are they going to learn grammar? You know, like first language, like a kid here first, but it's going to be a lot here and less transitioning to here. However, however, this is not defunct. It's kind of attenuated, right? A 20-year-old can still learn to ride a bike or a unicycle or drive, right? So that means with enough exposure, maybe of the right type, which is one of the topics we'll talk about today. What type do you think is better for reaching here? Emergent or, or, or explicit instruction? So implicit, non-explicit instruction. I'll be careful. I tend to use the words classroom and emergent uh, synonymously with explicit and implicit, which of course not the case. So more immersion-like or more explicit? Which would force it here, do you think? Emergent. We have that for that. That's one of the things I'll talk about later. Okay, so you can push things here with a type of, not just the amount, because of course the amount will push here too, that's one of the main principles, right? It's a practice, gradual learning and procedural memory, but also the type of input. Okay? Um, we talked about this briefly, so basically if you hear the cat a million times, you're gonna probably just store it as a word, so it gets shifted to declarative memory from procedural memory. Uh, we just talked about that. More L2 input means you proceduralize more. We just talked about that as well. Okay? So, um, I already talked about converging evidence. I'll repeat it here. To test a hypothesis or a theory or prediction, to show that it seems to be right, you want converging evidence. Evidence from lots of different sources, different labs. I'm biased, right? I like my model, right? I'm going to be biased towards my model. Uh, different tasks, different methods. You know, maybe you can combine methods, <laughs> like Pete does, EEG, fMRI. Um, you want lots of evidence from different sources with every single method. There's no panacea, there's no magical method. Right? Every method has its weaknesses, every task has its weaknesses. So through converging evidence, we, we, we try to test our theories and hypotheses and predictions through converging evidence. And I'll show you evidence from all of these today. Behavioral, focusing on correlational evidence, neurological, from various disorders. Neuromaging and electrophysiological from event related potentials. <coughs> so, the rest of the talk. First, I'll talk just four slides on evidence from first language. That'll give us a basis, because we've had the basis so far to build up to this. Then, that'll give us a foundation to build up to this second language, again from the same source of evidence. And then, we'll use that 
to make predictions and look at the evidence for how second language <coughs> learning and pedagogy can be improved. Now I realized, so I was telling my, my lunch mates here, I probably should have cut back on some of this stuff, the foundational stuff, I think, given your interest, and done more here. So I'm perfectly happy talking after the last slide about some of these issues, like more on how language can be improved, second language learning can be improved through some of the methods that we're just starting to look at that I'll talk about here. And I probably, because I haven't done that much work in that yet, we're just getting into that. Okay, so first language first, four slides. Okay, behavioral, neurological, uh, neuroimaging, and then electrophysiological evidence. So, this is one of my favorite techniques, um, cor correlational approach. So, if along that row, you're better at declarative memory than you, than you, than you, than you, okay? Who should be best at, at, at learning <coughs> words, according to our model? You're better at declarative, you're worse at declarative. Who should be best at learning words? You, right? Because words are predicted to be learned in declarative memory. Um, how about in this row, you're best at procedural memory, and you're worst at procedural memory. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who should be best at, um, should that correlate, your procedural memory abilities correlate with how well you learn words? Words. Should the fact that you're best at procedural and you're worst, should that correlate with how good you are at learning words? No, because words are learned only here by hypothesis, not here. How about grammar? Yeah, yeah but maybe only at later stages of grammar, because early on, the grammar should be learned in declarative memory. Mm -hmm. So that's, you get the idea about the correlational approach. We're looking for such correlations, such associations. And so this paper, which we published last year, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we did a meta-analysis of such studies in kids. Later on, a few slides from now, I'll show you the same thing in second language learners. So this is building up to that, okay? This is in kids learning their first language, okay? So a whole bunch of studies, kids, correlations, and so on. <coughs> so meta-analysis, for those of you who don't know, is a study of studies. It's taking all the results from a whole bunch of different studies and saying, what's the pattern among them? So it's much more powerful and reliable than any single study. It does a much larger uh, subject pool, more variability, so you see the common patterns and so on. <coughs> so. What did we find? We found, in fact, <laughs> to make it spatial here, okay, that in fact you do show the pattern that we just talked about. That is, the better you are at declarative memory, the better you are at vocabulary. Declarative memory abilities predict vocabulary abilities. Procedural memory abilities do not, exactly like we said here. It doesn't matter how good you are at procedural memory. There's no relationship among procedural memory and vocabulary abilities. That's the those word retrieval, vocabulary subjects, and so on. Okay, and this is across many different languages, by the way. So it's a meta-analysis. Okay. Grammar, in contrast, grammar abilities in kids, okay, in first language, are predicted by procedural memory. And these are just the size of the R values, the correlation values. So that's the procedural memory grammatical ability but also by declarative memory, but much more weakly. So the bottom line of this slide is, through these correlation, this correlation approach, what does it show, where does it show that words are learned? Everybody point or say it? Declarative. Where's grammar primarily, what is grammar in kids primarily dependent upon? Procedural, but also declarative, last several. Okay? Now if we did this in adults, other complications I won't go into for that, but where would, what would we predict? How would this be different or the same? With the declarative, for uh, first language, this would be the same for words, this would be the same for grammar. We would predict that grammar should no longer depend on declarative memory because they learned it all in procedural memory by then. Okay, so now let's look <coughs> at neurological evidence. Very simple logic. You damage this, what are you going to have problems with? Okay. Words. You damage this, what are you going to have a problem with? Grammar. That's what this says. That's all it says. Okay? And we're specifically contrasting medial temporal of amnesia, so we have lesions to the medial temporal lobe, declarative memory of problems with, of course, abnormalities to that, declarative memory problems and word problems. You don't have problems with this. 
the basal ganglia or grammar or procedural memory, and vice versa for developmental language disorder, where here you see a picture of the head of a chronic nucleus being, showing abnormalities. So this really nicely shows what's called a double dissociation in psychology between associating declarative memory and neural substrates to words and, and procedural memory and neural substrates to grammar. And you see the same type of double dissociation and clustering in these two disorders at the bottom, these two adult onset disorders. Which of those do you think is more like this? This Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, which is more like medial temporal of amnesia? You could probably just guess correctly. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is more like this in terms of the path. Okay, now let's look at neuroimaging. This is again a uh, meta-analysis uh, using a technique called active activation likelihood estimation, invented actually by one of my co-authors here, who's at Georgetown, Peter Chirkov had another Peter, probably Peter's in the neuroimaging. Um, <coughs> we published this earlier this year. So this is not the best way to study this because ideally, of course, well, this, is, this, this section of the talk is on first language, so this would be on kids. People don't study this kind of thing on kids. So this is a proxy, um, which is um, lear language learning in adults. So in a sense, you can also think of this as adult second language learning, even though I'll show another slide on that later. So just think of this as learning language in adults, which we are interpreting in the context of my talk as first language, but really it can also be thought of as second language. So, how does language learning going in adults work, either words or grammar, with different types of paradigms, because this is a meta-analysis across many studies. Here's where activation is found across studies. First of all, there's lots of activation for both words and grammar, word and grammar learning in language areas in the frontal lobe, but the key difference that we're going to focus on, and also in posterior parietal, which is interesting, <coughs> is this versus this. What structure is that, anybody? You're allowed to talk. <laughs> it's the basal ganglia, it's the caudate nucleus, the front part of the caudate, head of the caudate nucleus. So that is associated with which of the two memory systems? Procedural memory. So grammar is learned in, according to this, okay, again, converging evidence. Whereas this is um, inferior temporal, the ventral stream, which is very closely tied to, uh, I think more and more people are thinking of it as one continuous uh, circuit um, with uh, declarative memory. Okay, so this is consistent with uh, learning in declarative memory. Then, this is also really cool, we split the grammar data into what we have previously predicted to be learned in declarative memory or procedural memory. Because remember, grammar can be learned in either one, right, we said, right? So for example, if it's explicit instruction or if it's chunking, like learning the cat, that's how it it's, it's presented, like lots of repeated terms and stuff like that, com uh, uh, combinations of forms. It should be one more here, in other ways, like implicit instruction, so on, should be one more here. So we separated it a priori into um, training paradigms that were either pushing it, that we had predicted, would either push it here or here, and we looked at the activation. So this is what we call declarative learning, the ones that should push it here, that we predicted should push it here. Where do you see activation? What's that? What structure is that? Seahorse? <laughs> hippocampus. What's the hippocampus? Okay, and none of the other ones. And how about the non-declarative ones that should push it here to procedural memory? Basal memory. So what's the one-liner of this slide? In adult language learning, words seem to be learned in this ventral declarative memory system, consistent with the other evidence. And grammar is learned in procedural memory, but when you look carefully, it can also be learned in declarative memory for those ways of learning that can push it toward this side, which is this down here. And the final slide for first language <coughs> is electrophysiological evidence, which simply means electrodes on the head or in the brain. In this case, it's EGs, you know, electroencephalograms. Like sleep studies, you just put like electrodes on the scalp on top of your hair. You look at the brain waves, right? So you can, we do that in cognitive neuroscience. Um, and what we do, instead of looking at the continuous brain waves, is when I give you a word, or I show you something, hand, I look at your brain waves at the point, following the point of presentation of the word or the object or whatever it is. So it's the event-related potential. It's following the event 
of like presentation of an item. Okay, so what happens when I give you a board? What happens when I give you a map of form stuff like that? Okay, you can see on the surface of the brain what it looks like. And so when you <coughs> have a vocabulary, a lexical semantic anomaly like, I like to eat tables. Okay, you all should have been in for 100. Okay, probably. So you can manipulate your task to try to get this in for 100, and then you can see where it comes from. And the bottom line is that lexical manipulations like this lead to N400s, which is this negativity here. Grammatical anomalies rarely do. It's also elicited by other semantic stuff that's on declarative memory, and it seems to be come from parts of the brain that are engaged in declarative memory, including the medial temporal lobe and the, and the hippocampus. So the bottom line of this column is that evidence from this source also, remember converging evidence, also ties words to declarative memory. In contrast, grammar often, but not always, leads to this left anterior negativity kind of here. Um, lexical anomalies like A to table do not. It's also elicited by nonverbal sequences it's linked to frontal regions and might be tied to procedural memory. Less clear than on, on the N400 declarative memory side. So the summary of first language is converging evidence from several sources of different types of um, evidence. And including meta-analyses across many studies, tie words where, word learning where, in kids and, and adults as well, declarative, and grammar primarily in, in first language, but secondarily here as well, depending on how it's learned <laughs> and how early you are the kid is. Finally, let's turn to second language, not finally, but before we get to the learning enhancement part. <coughs> this is just a, a recap of what I said before. So declarative memory improves during childhood and plateaus in adolescence or adulthood. That's just this thing here I showed you. Bad, gets better and better during childhood, is best around early adulthood. Procedural memory is pretty good, okay, early on, and then goes down, although it's less clear. Therefore, what does a young kid look like? Bad, good, and a, a young adult, good, worse, okay? And therefore, we predict that Whereas kids will learn whatever it is, right? First of all, it's first or second language, but it's also not just language, but also navigation, whatever else. They should depend heavily on what? Procedural memory. That's why your violinist or your acrobat can get pretty procedural right, when they start early. Even though first they're gonna go, oh, what was that? I have to do this for explicit body to tend one declarative memory. Okay? Whereas your young adult is gonna depend a lot of declarative memory and may not transition even with a lot of practice here, although they can, and we can push that, such as some of the techniques we'll talk about, like immersion. Okay? This is just a schematic of the same thing. Words should always be learned in declarative memory. Grammar should depend more on declarative memory in second and first language, and earlier than later in second language learning, and vice versa for procedural memory. So grammar should depend more on procedural memory in first and second language and higher than lower exposure second language. Look at the evidence, the same four lines of evidence as before, to make it so you can compare it. <coughs> so this correlation is actually the same paper we published last year, but for second language now. So it turns out that people have, this is a meta-analysis so based on previous studies, had not looked at word learning, but only at grammar learning in second language and at earlier and later phases. So this is much more interesting. We were really happy about this when we realized this in the literature, okay? So where would we predict, say without looking at the, at the screen, where should grammar depend on first, early on in second language learning, here or here? Declared. And then later on, procedural, because we think even adults can proceduralize, which is key to what we're interested in here, if we, if we want the language learners to automatize and be fast and reliable and good retention. And that's what we found. How good your declarative memory, so, so this is um, grammar abilities at early stages of learning, low experience, and at high experience. When you're first learning a language, and when you're really good at the language, or better at least. What predicts how good you'll be early on? Declarative or procedural? There we go. Look at that, and that's just the, the R value here. And that's procedural. Tiny. Less than zero, actually. Probably because the seesaw effect. 
How about high experience? What does grammar depend on? Which learning assessment does grammar depend on? Procedural, and not at all declared. Procedural, and not at all declared. Really, really powerful. And remember, this is a meta-analysis, so across many studies, many languages, many tasks, different aspects of grammar. So second language learner, just recapping, let's drive this home. Initially learns grammar where? Point. And then more and more here. <laughs> In fact, this may be too detailed for you, but I think it is of interest. What really seems to be happening, based on the broader literature, and this is something we go into in this paper I just mentioned before, this annual review paper, what seems to, the way it actually seems to work is when you learn something that can be learned by other system, you learn it here. This takes a while, but you're learning it here from the beginning. What happens is, though, that because this is learned well initially, because it's like, you know, you know we're going to have lunch today, this takes a long time, until the, 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 the strength of what you learned here becomes stronger, you're, you're, you're relying on what you learned here, but it's learning here all the time. And only after you've learned here long enough for this to become strong enough does it, is it in a sense, stronger or access faster than this. That's what probably is actually going on. There's not that, uh, the people who study like, these traditional theories of SLA, like crash and stuff like that, get, it's completely wrong, right? You don't transfer the knowledge. That's, there's no homunculus in the brain to do that. So this is really what's happening. You're learning all the time in both, but then this gets strong. Like I know, you know, stuff you told me five minutes ago, whatever. And only when it gets strong enough does it get to be relied on. And then there's the rat studies that if you really show that if you lesion this, it goes back to this. It's still there. So if you lesion, in fact, we'll, we'll show this. We'll show this. If you lesion this system and these guys, they'll go back to this, relying on declarative memory and lose the automaticity and so on. Okay. So, um, is, this, is this visible? Yeah, and maybe the lights are too strong, I don't know. So, let's look at neurological evidence. When you lesion um, your declarative memory system, mm -hmm. you have more problems in your L2 than L1 gram. So what? You know, if you punch me in the gut, I'm going to be worse than my L2. It's weaker, right? You know, if I don't have enough sleep, I'll be worse than my L2. It's just, the L2 is weaker. But what's interesting is this side, right here. If you lesion this, your procedural memory system, and there are a number of studies now in different languages, Parkinson's disease or just focal lesions from stroke. Look at this. Your first, the grammar in your first language gets worse than your second language, and you're better earlier, uh, I mean, not better uh, earlier, but uh, your second language with more exposure is worse than that with less exposure. Okay. So the better language gets, gets damaged. Now that's cool, right? That's really suggesting, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really suggesting that procedural memory underlies grammar in first more than second language and higher L2 exposure more than lower exposure L2. And you don't find that for words, which suggests even more that this is about grammar, not just a general finding about first language. So this really ties grammar in L1 and in higher levels of L2, later stages of learning to procedural memory. <coughs> this is another meta-analysis that is still in preparation. Oh, here it is. Um, the, the same technique of um, activation likelihood estimation. Uh, this is first and second. So the last one was language learning paradigms, like in a laboratory, teaching words, learning gr artificial grammars, or things like that. This is actually the second language learners out in the wild, or then come in for brain imaging. <coughs> so for lexical memory, we see the exact same activation in this ventral stream area tied to declarative memory. And for L2, but not for L1. And for grammar, again, in the basic ganglia. So this is now two completely different sets of studies and two different meta-analyses showing the same pattern, tying grammar to procedural memory and words to declare memory. It's really nice, really, really nice. And finally, in electrophysiology, actually, I'm going to go back, or close your eyes or something, look at me. Should we find N400s for, not just for first language learners, like we said before, but also for second language learners, whether it's at low to high proficiency or exposure? Yes, because words should always be learned here. No matter who you are, when you're a kid, when you're an adult, 
You always by hypothesis have to learn words here, and since the N400 we hypothesize is tied to the cleric memory, that means when I say I'm going to eat, I like to eat tables, all of you should show in 400s, even if you're a second language learner. And that's what the evidence shows. In first language, in low exposure, second language, high exposure, second language. How about grammar? So if you say, yesterday I walk over there instead of walked over there, I'm going to show left frontier negativity, right? We think in part to procedural memory. How about a second language learner? Early stage second language learner? No because they haven't proceduralized yet. And in fact, they may show an N400, which for the N400, suggesting a dependence on declarative memory, which they do in a number of studies. But at high exposure, a number of studies have now found that they do show left into negativity. So the summary of this slide is through this eventuated potential evidence, again, ties words to where? Always. And grammar to either system, early on here, later here. And that's for the summary of the last four slides as well. Okay, now, uh, this is just a quick summary. Since we don't have much time, I'll go quickly here. Um, this is just summarizing that converging evidence from all these different approaches, neurological, behavioral, neuroimaging, electrophysiological, suggests that language does depend on both memory systems, and that lexical and grammatical knowledge do, in fact, depend differentially on the two systems. Words basically have to depend on declarative memory, grammar on either, and more declarative memory in number of conditions, in particular in second language. It's the bottom line. And therefore, the two memory systems can do the same thing to some extent for grammar. Both memory systems can support grammar. They play redundant role. This is not how a lot of our field works. People say, oh, grammar's done this way. No, it's done this way. You're wrong. It's done in the liver. No, it's done in the spleen. Oh, come on. The spleen is ridiculous. It's the liver. And we're saying, no, it's both the spleen and the liver. By analogy. <laughs> okay? We're saying it's both declarative and procedural in very specific ways. Okay? And, and we understand more and more how that, what affects the relative dependence on each one, how that can be pushed around, stuff like that. And that's how biology works. If, for thermal regulation, right? So I'm sweating now because I'm talking and moving and the lights, right? So how can I cool myself down? <coughs> I take a shower, go for the view. <laughs> I can drink something, I can take my shirt off, you know, whatever. Thermal regulation has multiple solutions. Fat, hair, antifreeze molecule. Why would cognition happen? Why would something as important as cognition, particular language, which is so important for us, be done in one way? It's silly, right? And this shows that's not true. Okay. So now we move to <coughs> implications for ultimate learning and pedagogy. And again, I'm happy to, I mean, the last slide is finished to talk more about this, particularly <coughs> discussion and questions. So I'll focus on two things. We've done more work on this than this, but in a way this may be more interesting. I just have one slide on this. We're just getting into it. <coughs> so uh, the bottom line of this section is that cognitive science, neuroscience findings, suggests that the type of L2 exposure matters. I've already said this to you several times, right? That immersion is better than classroom or explicit instruction, at least for grammar learning. Mm -hmm. Certainly with respect to the way the brain does it, and possibly in actual performance as well. So if you want to automatize your grammar, if you want to become really good, reliable, robust, good retention, and procedural memory, which way is better? Just making this repeating for the bottom line. Immersion or explicit instruction? <laughs> Which is not the case necessarily for word learning. Okay? We actually haven't looked at that. And that's, I'm not sure if it should be the case. I think it should be. <coughs> the second point, which is just actually one slide in today's talk, again, I'm happy to talk more about that, is that there are cognitive neuroscience approaches that can further improve or that can enhance second language learning and retention, and the one that we've, ones we focused on initially are ones that you're probably mostly at this point familiar with already, which is spacing and testing, which as you'll see in this one empirical study that we carried out in Turkey with collaborators, English learners in Turkey, um, really seems to enhance word learning, okay? And in case I forget later, we published a paper last year, um, a kind of 
theory and review paper looking at the literature and also showing in other studies that this is true, where learning is enhanced by spacing and testing. We just kind of did it in a more in a combined and rigorous way. Okay, <coughs> let's go through this briefly. The various factors that modulate whether grammar will depend on declarative versus procedural. Okay. And type of exposure also matters, that is immersion versus classroom or explicit instruction. These are various subject item and learning related factors that we've seen, or that I'll show you briefly here, that are predicted to modulate, to affect the relative alliance of grammar on these two memory systems, in both second and first language. Okay? And these can influence second line of performance at different points of learning trajectory. You can push it to one or the other at different points during the learning process. So for example, age of acquisition we saw, it's just the second versus first language. If you're older, you know, if you're an older kid or an adolescent, you depend more on declarative memory for grammar. Sex, which sex, male, female, depends more on average on declarative memory for grammar? Mm -hmm. Females. Uh, I didn't talk to you about this. We have a paper that's kind of very slowly <laughs> coming out. Um, um, all the analyses are done, which is basically, it, seemed, it suggests that um, non-right-handers, left-handers and ambidextrous people, um, um, you think they're better or worse at declarative memory? No, wait, I, I've been guessing. They're better at declarative memory than okay. right-handers. Or strong right handers at least. Um, and so you make predictions about that, they should learn second language more and declare it. Okay. Um, you know, similarly for genetics, right? Uh, different alleles, versions of the genes that affect declarative memory or result in better and worse declarative memory. Those with genes that result in better declarative memory um, should um, depend more on declarative memory for grammar. Higher estrogen should depend more or less on declarative memory for grammar. More. So you get the idea, and lots of other factors like this. Um, however, there are learning-related uh, factors that also affect this, including uh, L2 exposure proficiency level and type of exposure. We've already looked at this at, at length. To summarize, the more you're exposed, the more you depend on procedural memory. Lower exposure, as we've seen in multiple slides now, depends, grammar depends on declarative memory, and more exposure on procedural memory. But now, I'll emphasize that this part of the talk is on. Type of exposure also matters. With explicit instruction, it tends to promote learning and declarative memory. And implicit or immersion type of instruction, learning and perceived memory. So the bottom line is that eventually, okay, eventually meaning because it takes a while to learn in procedural memory, immersion is better than classroom instruction for grammar, okay, at least insofar as automatization, retention, reliability speed of processing, stuff like that. Okay? Here is a, it's not a meta-analysis, it's a basically a systematic review, quantitative synthesis, just counting up studies. So this is the proportion of studies <coughs> either uh, with immersion input or explicit, so immersion or implicit, or classroom explicit input. Again, this is simplification here. Um, that show these different event-related potential components. These are tied to grammar in first language. This is the N400, type of declarative memory. Look at this, immersion leads to native-like processing, including with the LAN and ELAN, the early LAN, which has been tied to procedural memory. So if you want to become native-like in your grammar, immersion or explicit instruction? Immersion, okay? Where is it? Classroom instruction actually does the opposite. And here's a study just to show this published just now about 10 years ago. Yeah, less than that, actually. <coughs> um, so with Kara Morgan Short, uh, who was my grad student at the time, is now a professor at uh, Chicago. Um, very often in cognitive neuroscience, one finds brain patterns before one finds behavioral patterns. So that's one reason looking at the brain is very useful. <coughs> so here's low exposure proficiency and high, so early on in training, later on in training. The classroom input, the immersion input, okay? Uh, classroom input early on, we find nothing. There's some reasons for this. We think it's because they're using different strategies, so in this time window, it's all messed up. Later on, oops, sorry. Later on, the high proficiency, the classroom life shows kind of not really a native life pattern. 
a native-like pattern is a left anterior negativity plus a P600. They showed a P600 in here. I haven't talked about that except for a couple slides ago. And this weird positivity, which is probably attention-based. So what does the classroom-like um, input look like? Do they look like a native speaker of a language? No. They look weird. How about the immersion implicit input? Early on, they shown in 400, suggesting declarative memory dependence. And look at this. This is after just a few days of training. They look like a native speaker of English or Spanish or anything else. A left anterior negativity and a P600. It's exactly what I would look like in English, okay, with grammar. Then we brought them back. This is a cool part. Five months later, on average, okay? What do you think they showed? Do you think, any, any ideas? Do you think that the implicit immersion group still showed a native-like advantage? Yes. And in fact, both groups became more native-like, probably because of consolidation, which is actually really cool. So basically, the bottom line for you guys is don't do anything for five months, stay home, and they'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true, actually. <laughs> now, now, I don't know if they would get better as compared to someone who had been practicing those five months, we didn't look at that. <laughs> but even without um, exposure in the five months, they got better. Probably because of consolidation. So here we brought them back five months later. So instead of 30 people, now only 19 came back. This is a high proficiency, the 19. And look at this. They got more native-like in all both cases. Okay? This is actually a stronger left activity, more left lateralized, and so on. So basically, after a period you're still of, of, of learning, you're still actually, your brain is working even though you're not being exposed to it, and you still find an advantage on the immersion input. Okay, last slide, which you may be more interested, so we can talk more about this afterwards in the discussion. <coughs> so, who knows what the testing effect is? Testing effect? No one knows the effect? People knew about that here. So testing effect is as follows. <coughs> the capital of Burkina Faso is Ouagadougou. I just gave it to you. I didn't test you on it. I presented it to you. Now I'm going to do a different thing. What's the capital of Burkina Faso? Okay. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> so by trying to retrieve it, even unsuccessfully, you're, I'm doing this testing effect. Basically, by you retrieving it, particularly if it's effortful, okay, you are going to remember it better, particularly in the longer term, like down the line, tested like a month from now. So the testing effect is recalling, effortfully in particular, recalling something rather than simply being presented the thing. And that results in better learning and in particular longer term retention. Okay? And this seems to work only in declarative memory. It not, does not seem to be relevant to procedural memory. How about spacing effect? Wagadugu, wagadugu, wagadugu. Three times. That's what's called massed presentation. Space presentation would be wagadugu. Wagadugu. <laughs> wagadugu. Or even spaced out to the, to the extent of a day or a week. People do that. Okay? It's a big literature on both of these. The more you space up to a certain point, the longer, the, long, bet, the better the longer term retention. Okay? This has clearer effects in declarative memory than procedural memory. It may apply to procedural memory as well, as I think. It's less clear. You can read our review, Ullman and Lovelet, oh, 2018, uh, last year. It's on our website. And we go through, we explain this, these, these two um, paradigms, explain them, how they work, and we go through the entire second language learning literature, both lexicon and grammar to show that they're effective and they do seem to be broadly effective. So we did a study, what people hadn't done is to test them together. So we did this in a study with collaborators in Turkey, which we're now almost finished writing up. <coughs> so the way we thought about this is, how do people normally study words? So you're in a classroom, okay, this is a chair. It's a chair, okay, it's a chair. And then you're test you have a final exam, this is just, you know, a possible, typical scenario, okay? You have a test a month later or three months later, maybe a final exam, and you study it. Oh, it's a chair, it's a chair, it's a chair. So you have mass presentation twice, probably, not typic typically without testing with this presentation, like you look at in the book. So we 
modify both of these in this paradigm, and we spaced it out over the course of weeks, and instead of have presenting them, being this is English words in Turkish university students learning English, we asked them what it meant after a very close presentation given to them. Okay? So it's spacing and testing. Okay, look at the result. So we call the typical, light green is typical, this thing here, the blue is the spaced and testing effect, both combined. Okay? So pre-test, there are no differences. Post-test, it's about 10 percentage points. That's like a whole grade difference in the English American <coughs> system. And even more, although not statistically different from this, but about the same, we'll call it, um, after a retention period of, I think, like nine days, I can't remember right now. So that means that combining these two techniques, testing and spacing, really, really has effects, because we're talking about a full grade, you know, big, uh, more than 10 percentage points difference even after a, it's not long, but reasonable retention period. You know, we don't know after three months or after a year. Okay. So these techniques that are motivated by the memory literature of spacing and testing, this spacing and testing not come from language, it came from the memory literature, it can be applied to language for theoretical reasons and seem to work. Okay. <coughs> there are many other approaches that we are starting to be interested in, things like diet and pharmacological agents, menantine and cholesterol inhibitors, which improve declarative memory, um, deeper encoding, depth encoding. There are lots of techniques, even exercise, lots of lots of different techniques. Um, we thought about like how to think about them. Like for example, some of these are what we call item specific. If you space what you're spacing is particular items, like the word what I do, but things like exercise, it's whatever you learn while you're exercising. So it's a more general subject level effect. So all these kind of cool things that we think about, that we're starting to think about, which are all motivated by this independent um, literature on learning and memory, which can really have effects on improving learning pedagogy. And that's how you probably feel, and thank you. <laughs>